Chapter 4 Plans for a Journey All right, said Dune. He leaned forward, elbows on his knees. Behind him, dust particles hung in the light from the window. Now, this is my plan. We'll leave three days from now, as long as it's a clear day. If it isn't, we'll have to wait. We can't risk getting caught in rain or snow. We'll go as early in the morning as we can, just before the sun comes up, and we'll walk fast and steadily all day. That should get us there by evening. We'll camp for the night inside the cave entrance. We'll have blankets to keep us warm. We could make a fire in there. And then, in the morning, we'll explore. We'll see if it's possible to go down into the city. And then what? Lena asked. By then, said Dune, I will have studied that book. I'll know what we should do. But Dune, what if you can't figure out any clues? There's the whole huge dark city, hundreds of rooms, all the storerooms, the pipeworks. I know, I know, Dune said. If I can't find clues in the book, we'll look to see if there's food and supplies, enough to help Sparks through the winter. There might be. People left food behind in their kitchens. There's probably still a little in the storerooms. The mayor had his hoard. You never know what we might find. Hmm, Lena said doubtfully. Dune went on. We'll spend one day in the city, camp again that night, and then we'll come back the next day. He finished with a brisk nod. Lena could tell he was pleased by his plan and eager to carry it out. Well, maybe, she said. Dune stood up and flung his hands out. Lena! he cried, clearly exasperated. People are in trouble here, and we might be able to help. What if we find canned food? What if we find medicine for my father's hand? And besides, he paused and his eyes gleamed, we have a book called For the People from Ember. There is something up there for us. How could we not go looking for it? You're right, she said. Again came the darting feeling that could have been either excitement or fear. But just in case something goes wrong, she added, someone should know where we really are. I'll leave a note for Mrs. Murdo. Somewhere she won't find it until we're gone. Dune agreed. Then he took a piece of paper from his pocket. I've made a list of things we need to take with us, he said. He handed the paper to Lena. She read through it. The list was long. Warm clothes, a blanket, candles, matches, dried food, bottles for water. Lena read on. You'll need a pack you can carry on your back, Dune said. Can you make one? I guess so, Lena said. We'll meet in three days, Dune said. Where the river road goes out into the fields, at the north end of town. All right, Lena said. She saw in Dune the determination he'd had on that last day in the School of Ember, when everything began. When he'd thrown down his job assignment and outraged the mayor. When he'd shouted out that the city was headed for disaster unless something was done. He wasn't shouting now, but he had that same fierce look in his eyes. At that moment the door opened and Edward Pocket came in. Aha, he said. Do I have two helpers this morning instead of only one? Dune said, No, I just had to talk to Lena for a minute. She's going. Don't you want to see my latest find first? Edward said. He rummaged through a heap of books near the door and brought out one with a bent purple cover. I read this yesterday, he said. It's one of the strangest yet. He showed them the title. Famous Fairy Tales. I read the whole thing, Edward said. But I'm still not sure what a fairy is. Some sort of combination of a person and an insect, I think. The strangest things happen in these stories. Like what? Lena asked, peering at the pages of the book as Edward flipped through it. There were pictures, and if she hadn't been in the middle of such an important conversation with Dune, she would have liked to look at them. Oh, said Edward, mostly terrible things. People turn into frogs, or go to sleep for a thousand years, or fight with huge lizards. I doubt that these things are true, but even if they are, everything almost always turns out quite well. 
Nearly all the stories have the same last sentence. They lived happily ever after. Of course, that can't be true either. It can't? Lena said. It sounded lovely to her, happily ever after. Dune was jiggling a foot impatiently. Of course not, said Edward. Unless this world we're in now works in a whole different way from the one where we used to live. Lena, said Dune, I'll walk out with you. May I borrow that book sometime? Lena asked Edward. He said of course she could, and she thanked him and went outside with Dune. So we'll meet in three days, Dune said once they were several steps away from the door. We'll go early, really early, before anyone is up. Can you be there just before sunrise? I'll be there, Lena said. It will be all right, she told herself. We'll be gone only a few days. It will be fine. It was easy to get Maddie to come help Mrs. Murdo. When Lena found her, she was by the riverbank, making her way slowly along, head down. Maddie was the kind of person who seems scary at first. She was big, and she didn't smile much, and she wasn't in the least chatty. But Lena had learned that there was kindness behind Maddie's stern appearance, so she approached her now without hesitation. Maddie was wearing a green cape that made her look even larger than she was. Her wild swirl of red-brown hair fell in tangles on either side of her face. She glanced up when she heard Lena coming, nodded, and went back to her task. "'I'm gathering round lettuce,' she said when Lena asked what she was doing. She showed Lena a basket full of small, round leaves. "'It's good for you, and it doesn't taste too bad.' When Lena explained about needing a change and asked Maddie if she'd trade places with her for a few days, Maddie said right away that she would. There isn't much going on here except building right now, she said, and building is not my specialty. So they arranged it. In three days, Maddie and Lena would change places. Persuading Mrs. Murdo was a little harder. She didn't understand why Lena would choose this difficult time to go away. But it's because it's a difficult time, Lena said, following after Mrs. Murdo as she went from one task to another, poking the fire, sweeping the dirt out the door, wringing out clothes that had been soaking in a bucket. I need a break from it. And Maddie needs a change, too. She'll be just as much of a help as me, more even. Maddie is a capable person, it's true, Mrs. Murdo conceded, scraping candle drippings from the table. It's only for a few days, said Lena. She gave Mrs. Murdo her best pleading look, although there was still a little bit of her that wished to be forbidden, so she wouldn't have to go. But Mrs. Murdo gave in, so there would be no backing out, and Lena began to get ready. For the next three days, she spent a lot of time trying to do things without being noticed. She said she was tired and went to her room to work on sewing sacks together to make a backpack. She kept a sharp eye out for everyone's comings and goings, and when no one was around, she took candles and matches from the cupboard. She took ten matches, hoping that Mrs. Murdo, who was very good at keeping the fire going, wouldn't notice. Two nights before they were to leave, she wrote the note for Mrs. Murdo. Dune and I have gone back to Ember to find something important. We have a good plan. Don't worry. We'll be back in just a few days. Love, Lena. She folded the note up small and buried it in the middle of a tub of dried beans in the kitchen. Mrs. Murdo used these beans for soup, but she wasn't likely to use half the tub before Lena and Dune got back. After that, she had one more night of restless, wakeful sleep, and in the morning, loaded with a heavy backpack full of all the things on Dune's list, she crept out of the house in the early darkness, long before anyone else was stirring. She paid a brief visit to the stinky, spidery outhouse in the backyard. In Ember, toilets were inside the house, right down the hall from the bedroom. And then she headed up the road. Stars shone in the black sky, and the ground, stiff with frost, crunched under her feet. When she got to the far end of the river road, she saw a shadowy figure. It was Dune, waiting for her. She hurried up to him. He had a pack on his back, 
and he was wearing his frayed green jacket and dark pants, but there was a dash of brightness about him, too. An orange scarf wrapped around his neck. Somehow it made him look ready for adventure. There you are, Dune whispered, even though there was no one anywhere around. Lena whispered, too. I'm here. I'm ready, I think. All right, said Dune. Let's go.